towards the end of the movie, moon and stars are in your pocket. All of us have dreamed with just the courage, determination and perseverance that we need to realize them into reality. We hope that this movie has left you inspired and motivated to pursue your dreams, no matter how big or small they are. Now we move towards the last segment of today's event. I would like to invite our esteemed guest, the founder director, Mr. Michael Haber from Germany, the executive director, International Center of Films for Children and Young People, Ms. Ellen Shivani from Iran, the director, graphic design animator, Mr. Nijadaru from Japan, the filmmaker and board member of CFEDGE, Ms. Azadeh Sakuri from Iran, Mr. Kurt from Czech Republic, Mr. Jitendra Kumar, sorry, Jitendra Mishra, the festival director, and Mr. Vikram Singh Verma from Smile Foundation to join us on the stage for the panel discussion. Along with them, we will also have our Delphi's joining them. So please put your hands together to welcome them. In the session, but I don't wish to interrupt too much. I wish to be a fly on the wall. Uh, I let my uh, student representatives take over uh, and, and run the show. However, there's a quick story I wanted to sort of tell you because uh, I don't know if you noticed today, uh, for the first 15 minutes or so of the film, we did not have subtitles. Did you notice that? And the interruption that happened for about 10-15 seconds was because we were trying to get the subtitles on. Right? Now, uh, my first twist with uh, cinema, international cinema actually, uh, was, was with a movie called Titanic. I don't know how many of you watched it, there was this movie that came out in 1998. Uh, and, okay, so some of you have already watched it. Okay. So back then, in the early 90s, when I was growing up, uh, we never had the concept of international cinema, world cinema. We never had exposure to world cinema. Uh, thanks to the OTT platforms that we have now, some of you have already been consuming content from all over the world, right? Am I correct? Friends on my left? But uh, so for most of us, while we were growing up in the 90s, the first interaction was with English movies, Hollywood or some, some British films also. Now, uh, our parents were, at least the middle class parents, were of the opinion that you know children should not be allowed to watch English movies. I never understood the logic behind it, but I think it was because they thought that um, uh, people in English movies kiss very clearly on screen, and what if my child watches them kiss, what if he starts random he or she randomly starts kissing people on streets? So with that fear in mind, uh, we were never, so the whole idea of you know our, our, our being able to watch English movies never occurred to us. Now why am I saying all of this is because when I was in class 6, there was this GK teacher of mine who used to run a GK quiz every week for us. She asked me once, Yashash, tell me why did Titanic sing? And I had no idea that Titanic was an actual tragedy based on which we had the film. So I very naively said, ma'am, I do not know because I had watched the film. And uh, the class went silent just as the auditorium is right now. Everybody wanted to burst into laughter, but they did not because the teacher was very strict. Then the teacher started laughing at me very derisively and then the entire class followed. I was very embarrassed and humiliated, not even knowing what was my fault because I was very honest. I genuinely had not watched the film, so I said that I have watched the film. Then I ran to my mother that day after school and of course I wrapped in her arm and I said, look, this is because of you, because you don't let us watch English films. This is what happens when you don't let, let kids watch, watch English films. Now my mother being the generous mother that she is, she, that day itself, she made the point that, you know, uh, I, I'll take you to the cinema, we watched the, the film uh, together, it was a prime time show, I think, 16 show, that very day, uh, she, she took me and my sister. The problem, however, was that the film was in English and I wasn't very conversant in English back then. So I couldn't understand most of the film. Uh, of course, I was also deeply interested in only knowing how did the goddamn ship sing, that was my prime motive. But anyway, the, the, visual, uh, the visuals of the movie were stunning. I absorbed some of them, some of them still stick with me after all these years. But uh, I wish I had subtitles back then or so you know, I was able to understand the language and I would have been able to absorb the beauty of the, of the film much better. So while, I, while this entire subtitle thing was happening, I was, that, that entire episode was running through my mind. And therefore, this is in some sense my, sort of the context to my first question. 
to the panel here and then I shut up and I let the student administrators take over. But my question is, how important do you think subtitling is in movies? Especially because if it's an international film festival, we are looking at cinema from all over the world. Uh, how involved do you think filmmakers, producers, curators are in the process of subtitling the film? Anybody in the panel would like to take that question? Yeah, so subtitle uh, is important, but uh, we call there is a visual script. If, it's, if uh, he or she is a good filmmaker, the, the screen should, you know, uh, do the subtitle itself. And why you watch a film uh, and with subtitle, you, you have to divert your mind, you know, uh, reading the subtitle. So you are not 100% uh, watching the film. So that's the sensibility. Uh, or uh, you can say that's a talent of the filmmaker, how uh, he or she makes the film, uh, how he or she uh, wants to tell the story to the audience. And cinema itself is a language, we say. I don't believe in, you know, uh, there is much importance of uh, subtitle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now I'd like my student representatives take over. Uh, we can shoot the first question. Sure, sir. Sure. So first of all, a very beautiful hello to all my talented <laughs> filmmakers, film curators. Of course, the film that we just watched, my goodness, such a beautiful film. So uh, my question is for Mr. Tupin, right? You were the associate producer of the film. It was such a pretty film. All the characters, whether it was Mr. Marty or it was Chotu or Lupton, every character was itself a story. I just wanted to know you, uh, what? goes inside casting an actor. Like what exactly do you see into an actor, that X factor? You know, even as a filmmaker or as a curator, whatever. What do you see into that person? Like, is it the eyes or the physic or is it the acting? What is it that thing that you see? If you ask me personally, I should first see the uh, try to discover whether he or she is passionate or not. It's not about the look, it's not about so it's about the if he, if he or she is not passionate, nothing will work. Oh, there are so many good looking people, though, but they cannot be actors. So this instinct should be developed inside. So passion is, is what you think is the ingredient? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So now I turn over the mic. My friend. Thank you, Misha. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Arjun. I am a man And my question would be to Mr. Daro. So, first of all, all your short films that you watched today, they were. I mean, I found them adorable, but they somehow managed to convey this immense, like, amount of emotion as well. And so, so that is uh, related to my question. Why, according to you, is animation or animated animals, why are they able to speak to children or us so well, rather than magic? Uh, sorry, I'm not good at English, but I will try. Uh, I used to be a graphic designer, so I can draw character, but I cannot move at first time. And but uh, I'm not, I was not satisfied uh, by only drawing. Then uh, I started to uh, make. So my original story, and then I learned to how to uh, make uh, my character move. Uh, I, I mean, I learned to uh, use how to use uh, uh, editing software, and I started to make um, animation. And then, as for live action, uh, I don't know much about the knowledge about live action. I mean, I'm a quiet person. <laughs> I'm always at home, and just I like to do uh, alone in a room by myself. So I, I, I make a, I as for animation, I can make all process by myself. So that's why I chose uh, animation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
ต่อไปแอนกูคือว่าเดี๋ยวนะไม่ได้มีเดี๋ยวนะแล้วผมไม่ใช่ Uh, how can I show this for my? I had a question for Mr. Kamal Sir. My question is that when you make characters, you can do one of the most fascinating things, or the like the ability to just do normal work. Um, what is the most important factor for you when you have to make a character that stands out? A character that when someone looks at that character, they would think, "Oh, Mr. Kamal made that guy," something like that. What do you think makes a good character? Well, uh, of course, the character designer of the movie you have seen is my husband. He's a character designer. And uh, I, I write a story for him, and I describe a character for him, uh, how, how he or she uh, looks like, how is the characteristic of the person now, uh, I mean, here, Daniel, uh, if uh, she is shy, if uh, he is, uh, I don't know, love to eat much, then, then after he designs the character. According to the uh, things that I describe, for uh, this is the process of the character design. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Hello, everyone. I am Arush. I am a former student, and I am a cinema enthusiast. It's an honor to meet you all. And as the people behind cinema, you are particularly the guys who are not seen in films but are behind them. So how do you keep up with the changing demand of the audiences? Like the things that are relevant today were not relevant 15 years ago, and the things that were relevant at that time are not considered entertaining today. So how do you deal with the changing demand of the audiences? It's a common question to all of you. Anyway. Sir, I just basically I want to ask how do you keep up with the changing demand of the audience? Like the uh, demand of the audience keeps on changing every now and then. You mean that uh, children could be different from the audience to the audience, from venue to venue, or from country to country? You want to ask, like, yesterday people uh, used to love uh, animation, but uh, today they want to watch sci fi. So that the demand is changing, you know, the audience demand is changing. So how do you cope, cope up with it? Like maybe as a festival organizer, how do you change the cater to the demand of new demands every year? I think the most important part is the story. And then you have something to tell or the special to tell in kind of animation film, then you have to use it. You will have more freedom in your head to describe and also to watch when you have an animation film. When you have a live action film, then it's a little bit, you follow the behavior of the main actor, and you can maybe find out what's similar or not, but as an animation character, you're more free. And this is often more attractive, also for the audience to watch, different from age to age, but I can also tell you, it's more universal than the talk in this animation. Maybe for an example, um, when we are showing a film inside you, only you, and we have a film in Norway, then we have in our mind, as a German, oh wow, this kid's grown up so fast, fine. And then a Czech kid is watching the film, oh, this is not for me, I'm angry about so this is always the difference of the high or the age of the children what they are playing. And the animation will be made more universal. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Sharma. I'm a 
Good morning everyone, my name is Anya Singh and I am a student of science currently studying in grade 12 and my question here is directed to Mr. Michael. So sir, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. We have all heard this very famous saying, right? So how do you, as the founder director of International Film Festival with children and young audiences, feel responsible for promoting the right kind of cinema towards a particular target audience? To, to, to bring films outside or? Uh, then what is your responsibility and how do you do your responsibility towards promoting the correct or ethical kind of cinema towards say children or teenagers or for any age group for that matter? If I understand right, the curation process, how do you curate cinema films towards that target audience? Yeah. The, the most important thing is that films must speak as emotions and as all emotions, it's all interesting. And when you have some way eyes inside and you can see the kids are laughing or crying, then you know that it's a right thing. And also, out of the point of an adult, I can say it's the film not interesting for an adult too, that it's not a good children's film. So you don't lose this point. That was quite an insightful answer, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Charu and I am from class 12. My question is specifically directed towards Mr. Sh uh, Mishra. Um, in the movie, I am Kalam, we see Chotu, the main protagonist, being extremely inspired by Dr. A.D.J. Abdul Kalam. So, my question to you is, do you have anyone in your life who inspires you to keep going, to stay motivated? Uh, my mother is my inspiration. She, she never went to school, but uh, she, she came out the highest education. Uh, uh, yeah, she, she, uh, she got married at 30, that time, 30. And uh, she has empowered all her children uh, so that I can sit here and talk to you. So she is my inspiration. Thank you, sir. That was extremely hard work. Good afternoon everyone. My question is to Mr. Vikram, sir. So, I wanted to ask, how do you determine an event or a specific piece that you do or the project that you undertake at Smile Foundation? How are they successful? And do you just look at the numbers? Do you look at some other intended effect that you wanted the project to have on the children or maybe for your work? How do you determine if the whole thing was successful and if it was or not? The impact of any project comes from the beneficiary. We work for beneficiaries. So it's the beneficiary who, uh, if, it, if that beneficiary has gained, we feel the project is impactful. So we deal in education and uh, like you in Google and So in education, we teach yeah. less people children who don't come to schools like this. But, uh, when they when when you find that they graduated and they gone to job, that's impactful. The livelihood program, uh, their class twelve dropouts, but when you find after you train them that they're working in a mall, so that's so it's it's the beneficiary. If the beneficiary is gained, we uh, we feel that we get the job. It's all for the I thought my question is directed to you. If you could just talk to our audience about the process of storyboarding. What storyboarding essentially involves, because maybe a lot of them do not know that there is a massive step in scripting and uh, shooting the film, which is storyboarding. So if you could just take us through the process. Okay. Um, so the storyboard is almost like a comic book. And it's the first picture of the script that exists. Because first the director, well I'm sure the scriptwriter, if they're not the same person, has the pictures in their head. But then suddenly they have this whole crew, which like I said could be this big. And they want the crew to have the same pictures in their head. So if for instance the first scene of our movie is a bunch of people in a panel discussion at a very nice high school, then maybe that's what it says in the script. 
but that could be anything. That could be, you know, a camera up on the ceiling, or a drone floating around, or a camera on a track behind us, or a camera on the track in front of us going past all of our faces. And each one of these decisions will have a different feeling. And the director, and only the director, is the one who decides, how do I want this to feel? Do I want it to feel scary? Or funny, or you know, all of these. So he makes, or she makes, um, a sort of an artistic decision, and then I sit down in the room with them, or more later these days on Zoom, and we say, okay, so what if the first shot was the glass on the table, and the camera follows the glass up, and we meet the first actor. And then you say, okay, so I make a little picture like this. And then the second picture is, okay, so what if the camera comes around and everybody does this and et cetera, et cetera. And so then we make a whole scene of, you know, 30 or 100 shots. And I take it to my room and I draw the pictures and I send them to him or her and they approve them. And then they send it to the crew. And that way the costume designer says, oh, it's raining. We need to have three copies of every costume. So you saw the scene where he comes out and he pours water on himself. How many times did they have to do it? How many dry costumes did they need? Or if somebody falls out a window, the stunt crew can say, do we see him land? And so they check the storyboard. Because if we don't see him land, then we can put a mattress there. And you know what I mean? Thank you, that's very insightful, thank you. Um, this is your chance to ask questions if you have any from our distinguished panel. Uh, we can take two questions from the audience, that's all the time that we have for. Uh, we have a roving mic uh, out there, Nanda Mahat can help us with it. Uh, so please raise your hands if, if any audience members has questions. Okay. Do we have questions? Audience, do we have any questions that you would like to ask the panelists? Anyone? Okay, we have one. Uh, I'm Hirshi, and my question is how much time does it take for a character to get animated? Just one character. And are there any, does it take more time to get by certain details or? Is there a different, you know, time process for each character? How much time does it take? It takes to animate a character. How much time does it take to animate a character? It depends to the movie which the director describes for the animator to do that. Uh, and uh, how she, how the character moves. Uh, sometimes, uh, although uh, each uh, minute took, took place 24, 24 frames, uh, and in each uh, frame, uh, the animator should do uh, the work. So, it depends how it is uh, designed. I cannot say a, a specific time for it. Thank you. And now we have another question for Mr. Sir. Hello, sir. I am Sanchit from class 11. And sir, this is a question on behalf of all the dinosaur enthusiasts who are here. So, yes, sir. Since you worked in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, so I, I would like to know that how did you research on, what all did you have to research upon for working for this film? Um, I'm also a dinosaur enthusiast. But it was exciting because a movie like that has a big budget. So they have a lot of money to even hire dinosaur experts to give us all the information we needed. Like, for instance, they said, okay, we have done these other movies, and there are a lot of dinosaur enthusiasts who say, you know, we want to see um, a Brachiosaurus, because we didn't see a Brachiosaurus in the last one. 
or we want to see a Diplo Dogus, because we didn't see that in the last one. So we want to make sure that those are in the script and featured, so all the dinosaur enthusiasts can have something to clap about when they say, oh yeah, it's Spinosaurus, for instance. So they, they gave us a lot of information and lots of uh, beautiful designs to follow, and then the 3D department made beautiful, uh, made beautiful copies of these animals. Okay. Good afternoon. I am Aditya from class 12. I would like to uh, ask a general question that how do you add depth to a short story uh, without making it too lengthy? Uh, the question is that how can we create a short story without making it too lengthy yet it should have a depth into it? Anyone on the panelists can answer this question. Like, it's like it's a smart way to tell your story. Like you, you watch a TV commercial, 15 second TV commercial, and then you you buy the product. Then the smartness of the you know filmmaker. So that's how we we have to start. Sorts are never sought. They are really big from inside. We're living in the time of ease where in another 30 seconds I think we're telling interesting stories, so maybe that's where you can learn. But I guess that's all that we have time for today. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience and thank you to all our panelists, including the students on stage. Thank you. With that, we close the festival. Have a great day ahead. And Vanda Ma'am will do the vote of thanks before we sign off. Thank you. So I would like to express my gratitude to all of you for being a part of this wonderful film festival. It has been an incredible journey filled with captivating stories and breathtaking cinematography. I would like to extend my thanks to all the filmmakers who have brought to us a diverse range of stories and have given us an insight into different cultures and perspectives. Your work is truly inspiring and your contribution is greatly appreciated. I would also like to thank our audience who have supported us by attending the screenings and participating in the discussion. Your presence and enthusiasm have been the driving force behind this festival. We hope that the discussion that we just had has provided a deeper understanding of the topic and sparked the dialogue and the reaction. Let's give another round of applause to our panelists for their contribution to today's event.